So there are a lot of questions recently about the extent to which uh, ideology is tied to group identity and the extent to which that might be rising over time. Uh, it's always a little bit hard to think about the whole broad scope of time because you can go back as long as people fighting a civil war over different political identities and ideas uh, in this country. But there is good evidence that in the recent past, there does seem to be a rise in the extent to which people are thinking about their political ideology almost like a sports affiliation. And that uh, with the tying of uh, political identities to group identities, there may be rising what's called affective polarization in the literature. So essentially, uh, sort of a intergroup hostility that comes from the linking of a political identity to kind of a group membership. The way that I sort of think about the link between political identity and a sports team is really the thinking about being a political liberal or political conservative, not only as a set of ideas and ideologies and sort of policies that you might encounter or, or endorse, um, but rather kind of like a affiliation, a group membership that you think about as competing with another group. So thinking about um, people who share a different political ideology or orientation, not just as individuals who have perhaps a different take on a particular set of policies or proposals, but rather as an outgroup uh, that invokes the same type of in-group, outgroup psychology that we've seen in a whole host of different uh, intergroup contexts, such as, for example, race relations or international relations. There's some interesting research that suggests that part of the hostility that we have towards our partisan outgroups has to do with what are called meta-perceptions, or in particular, our beliefs about how they view us. Uh, so many individuals tend to believe that the political outgroup looks negatively upon them, that the outgroup dislikes or dehumanizes them. And there's some interesting work suggesting that feeling dehumanized or feeling disliked by another group actually contributes to our own dislike and dehumanization of that group. So part of the partisan hostility comes from believing that the outgroup has negative views of our own as well. So one important question is how might we actually be able to effectively communicate and persuade across partisan lines? And there's actually some interesting emerging research that speaks to this question and really seems to be converging around the idea that part of the way that you can effectively communicate across political divides is by speaking to other individuals on the basis of the moral foundations or the perceptions and perspectives that they take rather than anchoring our arguments on things that seem to matter to us. One other consequence of rising partisan division actually has to do with the extent through the political apparatus to which uh, parties have worked with one another uh, in, in a bipartisan way across party lines. Uh, which seems to be decreasing. So there's, uh, there are some statistics that suggest that if you look back to the 1970s, for example, uh, there is about only 60 or 70 percent of the time did parties in Congress vote exclusively along party lines. Whereas if you look now, one analysis in 2017 suggested that almost 90 percent of votes in Congress are falling exclusively across party lines, suggesting that there's much less uh, bipartisan dialogue and bipartisan efforts to uh, enact social policy. One thing that we know in general from research on intergroup relations, that one thing that can be effective at reducing um, sort of competition between subgroups is by reinforcing or is to reinforce the superordinate identity. Uh, in this case, when we think about you know, politics in the United States, this could be in any country, it's really emphasizing the fact that we're all citizens of one nation. Uh, so highlighting in that case the superordinate identity of our joint nation uh, may be effective in reducing partisan divisions within the nation, which might be one way to bring the group to work together rather than to emphasize differences between the subgroups politically within the country. So 
another thing to keep in mind is it's not always the case that compromise and agreement and coming to one particular perspective is necessarily a desirable thing. There's a lot of research on the benefits of cognitive diversity and the importance of avoiding groupthink and having competing different perspectives can actually be really valuable in arriving at good and effective decisions. So on the one hand, we certainly want it to be the case that there isn't sort of uh, blatant intergroup partisan hostility between the various political sides, um, but at the same time, there's actually value to be found in the distinct perspectives of various groups, and a risk that too much emphasis on compromise might sort of reduce some of the valuable conversations that are happening potentially on either side.